Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Species Name Detective, Decoding Natural History. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Charlie Reinertsen. Charlie, thank you so much for being here today and for bringing us yet another intriguing topic. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thanks, Sunny. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm going to try to do my best not to uh, throw you right back into your eighth grade science class with this presentation, uh, but uh, we are going to talk about species names and how we can use them as a tool uh, to understand the natural world a little bit more. Uh, it might be a little bit reminiscent of learning about binomial nomenclature, but I promise it'll be more interesting. Uh, so this presentation will start with just a little bit about me. We'll talk about the anatomy of a scientific name and what we can learn from it. And then we'll use some examples and we'll be traveling to two different regions today. And these are two of the regions that I guide with Natural Habitat Adventures. Uh, we'll be going to the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem and Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. And then we'll go to the Monarch Wintering Grounds in Michoacan, Mexico. And we'll wrap up this conversation today with a couple trip itineraries. So actually taking a look at those two trips really briefly to just give you an idea of what it's like to travel with NatHab in those areas and some of the things that you might uh, be able to see. So just a little bit about me. I'm a, a conservation journalist, uh, photojournalist, and so I've worked in uh, the field of communications and marketing and education over the past 10 years. And it's brought me to some pretty incredible places on some amazing assignments. And one of my favorite clients is working with Natural Habitat Adventures and World Wildlife Fund. And they share kind of this shared ethos of trying to protect this incredible place, this one uh, home that we have that we share uh, with all of our um, wild animals and and uh, plants and everything. So uh, this is just a sampling of some of my work, uh, photography that I've done. Um, most of this is throughout the United States, but uh, I've also traveled to other areas for work. And then um, I've I've worked for a number of magazines, and most recently with a climate solutions exhibit, which brought me up to where I'm calling in from today, which is Saranac Lake, New York, uh, nestled in the heart of Adirondack Park. And uh, my photography journey really began when I was researching softshell turtles. And I got introduced to this incredible cast of characters. And it really just drew me into this world of trying to communicate through imagery and to try and inspire conservation through uh, different uh, media. And so today, though, we're really going to talk about scientific names and what we can learn from them. And scientific name detective is kind of this game that I like to play uh, when I'm guiding, where uh, the guest picks an animal and then we look up the scientific name and we try to figure out uh, what we can learn from that scientific name about the natural history of that animal. But why do we even have them? Let's take a quick look. If I were to say mountain lion, Florida panther, catamount, puma, deer, tiger, or cougar, all of those words are just different common names for one specific species, puma concolor or the mountain lion. So that's one reason why we use a uh, species name is because it's much more specific. It allows everyone who's communicating about that animal to be sure that they're talking about the same thing. The other place that common names, the pit, pitfall of common names is that they can be very pretty confusing. You might have a prairie dog that's not a dog, a flying fox that doesn't fly and isn't a fox, an electric eel that's actually a fish and it's not electric. So uh, there's a lot of potential confusion in common names. And then you can have regional common names. Uh, this is a really interesting one. Aspen, it's the word used for populus tremuloides in the Western United States and the Eastern United States, except for the South and the Midwest, they call them popular, poplar. And another example of this would be a tamarack um, uh, and a, a larch. That's another same species, but different common names. Another difference that you can find is that scientific communities, we work across countries, across the world. 
and there's language barriers. And so if we all adhere to one language when describing species, it allows us to be able to exchange information more easily and make sure we're being really direct. So to answer that question, why do we have scientific names? It's specific, it's descriptive, which we'll get into, and it bridges languages. So let's take a quick look at the anatomy of a scientific name. And that scary word, binomial nomenclature, which you might remember from eighth grade science. It's just two words, genus and species. And if you look at the family of life or the tree of life, you get um, you know, phyla all the way down to species is the specific thing. So genus is the group that a species belongs to. And then species is the particular identifier for one species. And a definition of a species is usually the ability to reproduce with another individual successfully and for that in the offspring to be able to then reproduce successfully again. So in the instance of hybridization where you have, for example, a brown trout mating with a brook trout creating a, or a lake trout and a, a whatever, you get the point. They can hybridize, but then their offspring are not able to reproduce. So that is separate species. For a singular species, they have to be able to cross-populate essentially. And the other thing about the anatomy of the scientific name is it's always grounded in Latin. Sometimes you'll have an exception to this, but largely if you, if you start to learn some Latin roots, which through this presentation you might find that you actually know more than you think, um, you can start to already take a guess at something about that critter or how it lives its life based on the roots that make up uh, the name. So without Further ado, let's dive into this episode of Species Detective. And we're gonna start in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And this is where Natural Habitat Adventures leads a trip from Grand Teton through Yellowstone and up to Bozeman or the reverse. And we'll talk about that itinerary later. Uh, but for now, those two national parks, they're part of a larger ecosystem that is really expansive and bridges states and it's in the western United States it's very mountainous and one of the creatures that calls that home is the mule deer and the species name is Odocelis hemionis and I'm not going to pretend to know how to pronounce all of these um, I'm sure someone else would pronounce that differently but if we take a look at those two words let's dissect the genus which is the first word first Odocelis, odonto and celis means hollow tooth. And mule deer all have hollow tooths. If you actually look in the center of their tooth, it actually tends to capture some, you get, get plant matter that gets caught in that area. Um, and all mule deer, um, and every individual from this genus have hollow teeth. Now getting down to hemionis, uh, it means half mule and it's reference to the ears because if you look at a mule deer versus a white-tailed deer, you're going to notice the mule deer is bigger, heftier, uh, has a black tip on their tail, and it has really big ears in comparison to its head. So that's one species. It starts to tell you some interesting information that you might not learn otherwise. And one of the tools that I like to use when I'm trying to learn about a species in my backyard, you know, maybe I'll look up cardinal and I'll search, you know, what can I learn about a cardinal? It'll probably take me to Cornell because they've got an incredible database of birds and they'll tell me some natural history information about that bird. But if I know the scientific name, I can also put in the search bar, search cardinalis cardinalis and find out, is there anything about that name that tells me something unique because I can bet if I just search deer, mule deer, natural history, it probably wouldn't lead me to find out that they have hollow teeth. And maybe that information isn't that interesting to me, but I think it's a nice way to get a new depth to uh, the, the organism that you're studying. So another creature or plant that you're gonna find in, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is sagebrush. And this is gonna be one that is pervasive, it's everywhere. And part of that is because sagebrush is incredibly adapted 
to uh, a really dry, arid environment. Uh, so a couple of their adaptations are that they have lateral roots and that allows them to soak up any rain melt or rain water or snow melt that's right on the surface. And then they have what's called a tap root. And that tap root, these plants are about three feet tall, one meter, and their roots can go below ground up to three meters. So that's you know three times as tall as the plant. And that allows them to access the water table so that they can ensure that they still have water throughout the year. And that's an incredibly important adaptation because most of the uh, water that comes in this ecosystem uh, comes as snowfall. And then during the summer, it's a very dry period where they don't have a lot of water. So if they can access the water table, it um, helps them survive. And that's why you see just fields and fields of sagebrush. But what's something that you already know about sagebrush? It smells really good. <laughs> And this is not your culinary sagebrush, that's a different variety, uh, but this is a Artemisia tridentata. So let's start to unpack what that species name can teach us. Artemisia is referring to Artemis the goddess or perfection. And this is interesting. Some sources tell us that it's referencing the fragrance that you get from sagebrush, but that's also a little bit questionable because there's no Latin root that would uh, would would suggest that. Uh, so unpacking the next part, tridentata, three teeth, three lobes on the leaves. So that is referring to an identifying uh, characteristic that these leaves have that help you ID them. So Artemisia tridentata. And going back to that fragrance, this starts to open doors to unpacking the natural history of this plant. So that fragrance is actually caused by a terpenoid compound. And that terpenoid is produced by the plant to reduce herbivory or other predators eating the plant. And the reason why it's really important for arid plants to reduce herbivory is because those uh, leaf structures actually carry a lot of water content. And so when you lose part of your leaf to a bug eating you or an animal eating you, you're actually losing water. And that's such a limiting resource that these plants have created adaptations to try and combat that. And this terpenoid compound is one of those ways that they're trying to, they're, it's a really bitter compound. It'll cause stomach problems for a lot of animals. Uh, and that's the fragrance that you're smelling when you smell sagebrush. And one of the interesting things is that there's this arms race going on where there are certain animals in this landscape who can process that terpenoid compound and handle it just fine. And that animal here is pronghorn. Uh, they spend most of their time in the flats. They're a prey animal, so they're, they're trying to watch out for predators. And so they want to stay in that area and there's pretty little food that they can eat, especially into the fall when plants start dying back. And so they actually feed on sagebrush, uh, similar to the sage grouse, which is another one that feeds almost exclusively on sagebrush, which is pretty surprising. And uh, just another kind of a fun fact about uh, sagebrush is that it, um, it's 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 incredibly pervasive. Um, it has that terpenoid compound, but another way that it helps to reduce water loss is by having on the surface of its leaves, back to this image, it's really fuzzy. And we call that pubescence or hairs on the leaf structure. And that does two things. It also aids with keeping bugs from eating it. It, it creates a physical barrier, uh, but it also actually, um, helps prevent water loss because it's creating a boundary area between air and the leaf structure that insulates the leaf. And so without going into a full lesson on thermodynamics that we don't need to go into that rabbit hole, just know that those hair structures are actually an adaptation that allow them to hold, help hold on to water. Uh, so that's that's one of my favorite plants to talk about and it's a it's a neat one as a guide because it's always there. You're never going to miss it. Uh, so anytime there's a gap in wildlife, we get to talk about sagebrush. 
So shifting over to another species, in the foreground of the picture on the left, you're seeing sagebrush. And then in the background, you're seeing this bright orange hillside. And that's all aspen trees. And this picture on the right is a picture of their trunks. And aspen are in the populus genus. You'll find birch trees in that genus. And the species name, populus tremuloides. So now we'll, we'll take a look at the species name and unpack some of the natural history of this species as well. So populus, it means crowded or many individuals. And this starts to get to one of the most amazing adaptations of aspen. And aspen is, is uh, not unique because other plants do this, but in this ecosystem, it's fairly unique in that it can create genetic identicals or clones uh, by shooting up new ramets from the uh, root mass. And so when you're looking at a stand of aspen, without doing genetic analysis, you don't know for sure, but generally one stand of aspen is a clone of aspen. And so the stand is referred to a genet and the individual trunk of a tree is referred to a ramet as a ramet. And this is a superorganism. So we call these superorganisms because they're massive. And these genets, these stands of aspen that are genetically identical, can live for centuries. This is one of the oldest uh, known living organisms on the planet. Um, those individual trunks, what we think of as trees, uh, they'll only live, oh, 100 years or a little bit more. Uh, but the genets themselves can live for uh, as long, I think the oldest one is about 3,000 years old in Asia, which is absolutely amazing. So we just learned all of that just from the genus, just from understanding one little mechanism that they have, which is producing clones. Now, aspen also have the ability to sexually reproduce, and that's inc incredibly important as well because it ensures genetic diversity. And genetic diversity just means recombination of DNA so that you create unique individuals. And by having a good, healthy amount of genetic diversity, uh, you can avoid um, different types of fungus or bacteria. You're more resilient as a species uh, to be able to fight different infections or things that come along. So that's, that's their double way of being able to reproduce. And one of the really neat things is as you're in the fall, you'll start to see aspen trees turn color. And this next image actually heightens it. This isn't perfectly aligned, but generally if an aspen stand turns color together, you might see a yellow stand of aspen and then an orange stand of aspen. And that's an indication that those might be genetically distinct. Um, it's not a definite guarantee. You'd have to do some genetic testing. Uh, but this image, just if you're curious, you know, this was taken in late September in Grand Teton National Park. So this would be one of the scenes that you would see if you were traveling with Matt Hav in that area. So just carrying on on this species name detective, Populus tremuloides. So if you've heard the term quaking aspen, that's referring to the leaves. And tremuloides means tremulo or tremble. So these leaves have actually, they have an adaptation that allows them to shake in the wind more readily than they would otherwise without this adaptation. So this image does an okay job showing it. All these pictures are ones that I've taken in the field and I'll have to take a better picture of what's called the petiole. So there's the blade of the leaf and then there's the petiole extending up to the leaf. And typically the petiole, if it's flattened, it's at the same orientation as the blade of the leaf. In the case of the aspen, the petiole is flattened and uh, perpendicular to the surface of the leaf. And that actually helps to encourage that leaf to shake. And uh, that's why when you see, say you could, if you could put an aspen next to a maple and an oak, and, and put just a tiny breeze, you'd actually see the aspen leaves quaking, whereas the other leaves might not be moving at all. And sometimes you don't even know that there's any airflow and yet these leaves are moving. So why are the leaves doing that? So another, another 
kind of story that I like to tell when I'm guiding is kind of uh, leapfrogging off of the magic school bus and thinking about actually shrinking down to the size of a leaf and actually going inside the leaf. And this will make more sense once we get to the other side of this story. So if you are an aspen leaf and inside that leaf, one of the things that leaves do, their primary purpose is to photosynthesize. And photosynthesis is the process of sunlight and carbon dioxide through a chemical reaction creating um, sugar, carbohydrates, which the plant uses for food, and water and the byproduct of oxygen. So plant leaves have to um, have gas exchange, which means they need carbon dioxide to enter the leaf and oxygen to be released from the leaf. This means that there have to be openings that go into the leaf structure and allow that gas exchange to happen. And in an arid ecosystem like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, that's a dangerous proposition. We already looked at all of the adaptations of sagebrush, both to hold on to water and to get water. Aspen also tend to live in areas where they're exposed to harsh sunlight. And so this adaptation of fluttering the leaves is actually geared towards reducing the surface temperature of that leaf. Because here, here we are again at thermodynamics. I promise it won't take too long. If the difference in temperature between the surface of the leaf and the air is higher, you'll have a greater rate of water loss or evapotranspiration. And if you can reduce the difference by cooling down the surface of the leaf and make it similar to the outer air, you'll hold on to water longer. So that whole adaptation and why those leaves are fluttering in the wind, it's all about trying to retain the water that you have because it's such a limiting resource in these arid places. Another thing that plants do just generally in this area is that they're regulating their stomata. Stomata are the openings in the leaf structure. Um, and so they open and close those. So when they need carbon dioxide, they open them up, allow the gas to come in and the oxygen goes out, and then they close it up so that they don't lose any moisture to the environment. Populus tremuloides. Uh, there are so many more fun facts that we could go into about aspen and sagebrush, uh, but we've got more animals to get to here. So uh, this is just a quick uh, slide of three animals that you can find in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem that have the same genus and species name. So Alces Alces is moose, bison bison is bison or buffalo, and Volpes Volpes is red fox. And I looked into like what these names mean and I, I couldn't really get to the bottom of it. So if anyone has any ideas or is able to research it better than me, uh, I'd love to hear from you. So let me know. Uh, but the, the joke that we always, uh, you know, say here is, is what did, uh, what did the mother bison say to her, her baby uh, when he was headed off to school for his first day? Now I'll let you, uh, solve that one. Bye, son. All right, we're falling off the rails here. So let's head to the Oyamel fir forest in uh, Michoacan, Mexico. And this is what we call the monarch kingdom. And Natural Habitat Adventures leads a trip here because there's this incredible ecological phenomenon where monarch butterflies all the way from the Rocky Mountains to the eastern seaboard up to the southernmost area of Canada, uh, all of those butterflies congregate and migrate together as far as 2,500 miles this time of year to be able to make it to one specific location in the Transvolcanic Mountains of Michoacan, Mexico. And we'll talk about why they do that, and we're actually going to get to that story through you got it, species names. So the monarch butterfly is Danaus plexippus. And this Danaus plexippus refers to a couple of things. One piece that it refers to is sleepy transformation. It also is referring to uh, foot structure, but we don't wanna get into that. We're gonna talk for now about this sleepy transformation. And to get to that, we're just gonna do a little crash course in monarch butterfly ecology. 
So we hear a lot about monarch butterflies are endangered, but when you get into the articles and read a little bit more, it's just the migration of monarch butterflies that's actually endangered because monarch butterflies exist just about everywhere in the world. All of these orange spots on this map are places where you can find Danaus plexippus or the monarch butterfly. They evolved in the tropics, right? that's where they first evolved, and they evolved to depend exclusively on milkweed as a food source as caterpillars in their caterpillar phase. Uh, so interestingly, there are two migratory populations in the world from all of those populations that we just looked at all the way from Northern Africa down to Australia, um, all of those populations, there are two migrations that we know of. And these migrations occur in North America. One of them is really small. It runs from, it pretty much stays within California, west of the Rocky Mountains. And they migrate down to one particular place on the coast. And uh, the one we'll focus on today is essentially Rocky Mountains to the Eastern seaboard. And you're seeing that kind of funnel that I've created on this map. And there are a couple theories about why monarch butterflies are migrating. One of the theories is that uh, the monarchs are following milkweed abundance in the summer. Because as I mentioned, when they're caterpillars, they're exclusively feeding on milkweed uh, to be able to get to that next phase in their life cycle. And there are many, many more milkweed species in North America, in the United States, than there are in northern Mexico. So even though they may have evolved in the tropics, they might have started to migrate seasonally to be able to chase that food availability until the cold would drive them back south. Because remember, they're that tropical species. They evolved in the tropics. They did not adapt to cold weather. They're very intolerant to cold, and especially cold and moisture. Uh, so that that led them to be able to to make sure that they would follow the milkweed north and then come right back down in the winter to be able to stay in a more temperate place. Another theory that drove migration uh, is parasite avoidance. So there are a number of parasites that attack both caterpillars and adult butterflies. And a lot of them are parasitoid wasps that lay their eggs in the caterpillar and then the larva feed on the caterpillar and the caterpillar dies. And so the thought is that if you migrate, as you move north, you would effectively leave parasites behind. Uh, whereas if you just have a solid population in one location in the tropics, it allows parasites uh, populations to grow and grow and grow. Um, and so part of the theory of why monarchs evolved to be able to migrate is because they were avoiding parasites. But we don't know the specifics of which of these three things or what levels of each of them really drove monarch butterflies to create this epic migration, especially for such a tiny insect. So just diving into the life cycle of these creatures, again, they're dependent on milkweed. There are a lot of different species of milkweed, but they rely on it in their early stages. So they actually lay their eggs on the leaf of the milkweed. There's some fascinating fun facts here. For instance, the female butterfly has these little barbs on her feet and she scratches the surface of the leaf. She's actually able to taste and smell the chemical composition of that leaf because here's what's special about milkweed, it's toxic. They have what's called cardiac glycosides that they produce, again, to be able to prohibit uh, insects and animals from eating the plant. And so they're toxic. But certain species, like the monarch butterfly, have figured out how to handle that toxicity. And monarchs actually go a step beyond that. Not only can they process it and sequester it in certain tissues and essentially deal with the negative impacts of this toxic sludge, they also use it as a defense mechanism. So that orange coloring that you see on their wings is a coloring that tells predators, don't eat me, I'm toxic, because they've been able to integrate and arm themselves with the cardiac glycosides from milkweed plants. 
So pretty fantastic, amazing stuff. But that means that the first job of these little larvae, these caterpillars, is to try and feed as much as possible on this toxic plant. And again, it's not perfect for them. And most caterpillar larvae or butterfly larvae are going to die. And it's because they have a really dangerous job. Uh, right here, this caterpillar is eating its egg, uh, which is the safest meal that it's going to eat in its whole life. Uh, so it does that first, and then it turns its attention to the leaf. And these leaves have what's called a latex. So that cardiac glycoside is in this gooey, milky um, ex ex substance that comes from the leaf. And these caterpillars have learned uh, to be able to snip a vein of the leaf, allow it to flow and release its cardiac glycoside. Um, and once it's drained, then they'll eat that section of the leaf. So that helps them reduce how much toxin is in it. And it also helps them reduce the latex, which is really gummy and gluey, uh, sticky. So if they get too much of it on their mouth parts, it will literally freeze their mouth parts and they will die. Uh, so it's, it's a tough life being a monarch butterfly larva. Uh, and they grow incredibly fast. You know, this, this phase from egg to fully grown adult caterpillar um, can happen in about uh, 10 to 15 days, weather dependent. It, it can last a bit longer um, if it's cold. And then they go into their chrysalis phase. And this is where we start to get to that idea of transformation, uh, sleepy transformation. And that has a double meaning that we'll get into. But for now, uh, this is a process of metamorphosis. So that caterpillar is going into another life form. All of its cells kind of go into this mushy goo. And then they reform in the form of a butterfly. And uh, you know, this whole process from egg to adult lasts almost a month. And then from adult butterfly, uh, they live almost a month. So the whole entire thing is a month and a half to two months, depending on how warm it is outside. Uh, they slow the process down when it's colder. Uh, but this whole thing, you can tell now, they're just unbelievably reliant on milkweed as a food source they need to have it and that'll come into play a little bit more as we get into the conservation of this species so this is where we start to talk about the migration uh, we're working backwards here a little bit so in the spring and summer monarch butterflies are making their way from their overwintering grounds in mexico north and so the first generation of butterflies flies in that blue funnel up into the southern United States. And then those individuals lay their eggs, those eggs go through the whole cycle and the adult butterflies emerge and they form generations two, and then they have generation three. So that's, that's the green swath in the Midwest and Southern United States. And then there's another generation. And so by the fourth and fifth generation, they've reached as far as Southern Canada. Um, and then at that point, uh, they start uh, shifting their migration to be able to go south. So this is again, looking at that spring to summer migration, showing you the two different migratory pathways um, of, of the California population versus the eastern seaboard population. And so what happens then is fascinating uh, because the monarch butterflies actually go into what's called reproductive diapause. They shut down their ability to reproduce. So that's that fourth or fifth generation of adult butterflies. And they're doing this uh, to prepare for this incredible migration. And so they increase their fat storage, they increase their lifespan, seven months. Uh, remember they, as an adult butterfly, you only live for about one month. And now in this life form, they actually live for seven months and they make their way to that one specific place. And these butterflies are actually detecting a seasonal shift. And part of that is temperature. Uh, once it gets really cold, the plants start to die back the chemical composition of plants starts to change and the butterflies can actually detect that. Remember, they can taste the leaf structure and the caterpillars are feeding on the leaves. They're getting 
all of this information from their food source. And then the other big one that drives butterflies to have this shift to another body type that's migratory is the light. And so the sun is actually changing its angle over Earth's surface. And due to that, uh, the, the monarch butterflies are picking up on that, the length of the day and the angle of the sun, and they start to migrate. And this is wild. The way that they do this is still being studied. There's so much research to try and understand how this half gram, three inch insect could possibly make it to a place that's, you know, smaller than Manhattan. You know, we, we love to compare things to Manhattan, but it's, it's a really small acreage in Mexico. And they navigate by using what's called a circadian clock, which is essentially um, hormones that are released based on the amount of daylight in the day that helps you figure out what time of day it is, roughly. And then an internal compass that helps them direct where to go. And their, their internal compass is based off of the position of the sun in the sky because it's at a different angle at this time of year. And then the area that their researchers are really looking into, and they think that this is a really good hypothesis, is magnetic field detection. Monarch butterflies have uh, these magnetite deposits on the base of their wings, and scientists believe that that helps them detect magnetic fields. And what's really fascinating about this is that you can then detect the magnetic field and navigate based on um, that field from the North to South Pole. But as you get close to their wintering grounds, there's actually a magnetic anomaly that helps them navigate to those transvolcanic mountains. It's because there are so many heavy metals in those volcanic active areas that it disrupts uh, the magnetic fields and allows them to hone in on the final stage of their journey. Really amazing stuff without going into it too, too much. Uh, but that brings us down to Michoacan, where these monarch butterflies gather in the millions. So it's in the transvolcanic mountain range. They're at 10,000 feet elevation in Oyamel fir forests. And this is where we start to get to sleepy transformation. So remember, all these environmental triggers change the body type of the monarch into that sexual diapause phase where they store fat, and they're able to migrate and they get down to this part of the world because they want that Goldilocks temperature zone. So everything about why they chose this place and the type of behaviors that they engage in in this location are about trying to reduce energy loss. Because remember, normally these things only live for a month and now they have to last seven months. So they have to make those fat stores last. And so that, that's gonna uh, play a little bit more. Now, this was interesting. This migration has been known uh, by Mexican communities and indigenous peoples uh, for a very long time. The Day of the Dead in November is built around the return of the monarch butterflies to uh, this transvolcanic mountain range. And the belief is that it's the return of the souls of the dead. Uh, with that said, you might remember this National Geographic magazine if you were around at that time in the 70s, and this was the scientific discovery of this migration. Up until this point, scientific communities didn't realize that monarch butterflies were making this epic migration. And this migration was really discovered uh, through the use of a tagging program where they literally put stickers on the wings of butterflies to be able to figure out where they were going. And this is just a look at those wintering grounds. And it's truly spectacular. There are right now estimated roughly 200 million butterflies that congregate in these areas. And they're really honed in to be able to find places where they can stay cool and reduce their movement and their metabolism. But what happens is that as the sun hits these branches that are weighed down with butterflies, the butterflies start to warm up and they start to fly. But on a cold day and in cold conditions, they're all bunched up on the branches. These branches normally would be horizontal or a little bit up. And with all of the weight of the butterflies, they're sagging down. 
Uh, and the bark of these trees is covered with butterflies too. So it's absolutely magical. And when you get those warm days, if it's later in the season, you can start to have butterflies fly. And, and it's just a, a magical thing to witness. And once you get into late winter, early spring, then they start mating again. They come out of that sleepy transformation, that uh, reproductive diapause, and they start migrating north. So that's an example of how just looking at a species name and learning a little bit about it can just start to unravel this incredible ecological story behind that organism. And so I hope that kind of through this, you've started to get curious about species names and maybe you'll start doing some searches um, and start learning a little bit more about creatures in your backyard or creatures that you're hoping to see on an upcoming trip. Uh, with that in mind, I'd love to just very briefly uh, go through the itineraries of these two trips, starting with the Kingdom of the Monarchs. And this is a quick overview. You'd fly into Mexico City and then make your way out to Ongongeo, which is the home base for being able to visit the sanctuaries, and a stop at Valle de Bravo, and then make your way back uh, to Mexico City. And on the first day, you travel out to Ongongeo, that's roughly four hours by coach bus. Uh, and then you take a covered truck to a horse and then hike to be able to reach the uh, wintering grounds of the monarch butterflies. And this is one of the largest reservations or, or sanctuaries in, in terms of how many butterflies congregate in that area. And then that evening, you would spend it in Ongongeo. Uh, which has really transformed with the ecotourism in this area. Day two, we'd go to another sanctuary, Sierra Chinqua, and take another covered truck to be able to get to a horseback ride, to be able to then hike, to be able to find uh, where the butterflies are at that point. And lunch in the reserve at Sierra Chinqua, and then uh, get to learn a bit more about the history of Angageo and how it's really taken on this uh, support of monarch butterflies, shifting away from mining and, and forestry to be able to shift towards uh, ecotourism. Day three, we go back to El Rosario, and that's a three days in the sanctuaries, which is really incredible for how short this itinerary is in the grand scheme of things, uh, to be able to give you the best chance to be able to see as many behaviors as possible. Maybe you get a couple cloudy days, maybe you get one sunny day, and then you have an experience like this. And uh, so it's it's just magical, That's it's, it's um, really amazing. And then there are a couple stops on our whip making our way back to Mexico City in Valle de Bravo, get to see some really amazing sites, and Toluca to be able to see some cultural um, installations of stained glass, and then finally making your way back to Mexico City. That was a whirlwind, but I just want to be able to get through this to be able to give you a quick, quick look. Uh, so this is the other trip that I guide uh, in Yellowstone and Grand Teton. This one is a seven day itinerary. You can either take it from Bozeman down to Jackson or ja Jackson up to Bozeman. And it's really a wildlife tour. So if you're looking for an uh, incredible hiking tour, this one is gonna get you moving, but it's mostly geared towards being able to find wildlife on the landscape. Uh, and we're also gonna celebrate all the incredible geothermal features that come with exploring a uh, super volcano. So we're gonna take a look at the northbound itinerary in this overview. The first day is spent in Jackson, Wyoming, uh, where, where we arrive, fly in there, absolutely stunning area of Grand Teton National Park where I've lived for a few years. And the next day would be exploring that place with a float trip on the Snake River, floating through some of Ansel Adams' perfect comp compositions of this area, seeing wildlife. And then day three gets up into Old Faithful area, seeing geothermal features, geysers, um, and, and hot springs, fumaroles, really incredible day. And then we get into some of our heavy wildlife days where you wake up early to be able to match your activity level with wildlife activities. You're trying to match the crepuscular animals like your wolves, your bears, um, all of your predator species are more active in morning and night. And so we also tie in 
a couple visits to spectacular places like the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone River. Day five, we head to Lamar Valley. And this is really the um, kind of defining feature of this trip. We base ourselves in Cook City uh, so that we have really quick access to the Northern Range, which is where you have the best chance for wolf uh, viewing. Day six is another day in Lamar Valley before saying goodbye to Yellowstone and making our way to Bozeman. And that's a quick, quick look. And we've got a few minutes here left for questions. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to hear more of my stories, feel free to go to twoline.com slash tracks and sign up for the newsletter to be able to get uh, stories from the field delivered to your inbox. And right now I'm working on the Northern Peatlands Project, uh, which is uh, a journey through one of Earth's rarest ecosystems. So uh, if you'd like to join me on that uh, adventure, feel free to sign up, but I'd love to take just a couple questions here as we wrap up. Charlie, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, <laughs> we'll start with a, a quick one just about who creates these species names? Who created, who creates? How's, what's that process like? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. The uh, person who identifies a species um, often is the person who names them, and then that person can choose to try to give these. You know, I really picked out species where the species name is giving indications to the natural history of that animal. Some animals are named for people, um, and you know, I think that there's a lot of power associated with that. And, and there's also been some interesting articles lately about, hey, maybe it's time to rename some species, uh, which has, has been an interesting story to follow. So uh, yeah, I feel like a whole book could be written on, on uh, who and how species have been named. That would be an interesting book. Um, <laughs> Tell us more about the mule deer teeth. Um, do they have issues with tooth decay? And what's the advantage of having hollow teeth? You know, I spent some time researching this and there are a lot of guidebooks that will tell you that deer have hollow teeth. And there are very few guidebooks that tell you why. Um, it seems to me like, like there's a mechanism there that, that helps with the longevity of the tooth. They're, they're always grinding things and chewing things, and I think it helps with the mastication of that um, that, that food. But I I didn't find anything definitive on that. That's a that's a really good question. <laughs> um, Aspen, if a stand turns, let's say yellow one fall, will they turn yellow every fall, or does the color vary? That's that's another good question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know if that's an environmental factor driving the color or if that's genetic. Uh, that, that sounds like you might have a study on your hands there. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, does a stand of aspen have accompanying fungal mycelium? Oh, that's a good question, fungal mycelium. Uh, so, Almost to my understanding, all root systems have fungal mycelium, and that just means a fungus that's growing in the root system, and it helps. Uh, it, it's it's interesting. Like we're learning more about communication between and and with trees, um, so maybe that's part of of what this question is getting at. Um, but the fungal mycelium is actually helping to create a network that allows for exchange of nutrients between trees and information, chemical communication. Um, to my understanding, Aspen have that as well, but I don't know if that area has been studied a lot. Mm. All right, let's do one more. Um, do you know of other species of butterflies that migrate even short distances to prevent parasite infestations? Yeah, I don't know specifically about parasite infestations, but I know that other butterflies do migrate, just not to our understanding yet at the scale of, of the monarch butterfly. Uh, so yeah, that's that's another good good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the last question we have time for today. So I'll hand it back to you for closing comments. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, 
and humoring me with the species detective episode. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I hope that you'll tune back in. I think I've got a, a few more coming up here this uh, winter. So uh, keep an eye on NatHab's website and, and uh, hope you'll join me next time. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure to have you on, Charlie. Thank you so much for bringing your creativity and, you know, interesting topics. I always learn so much. Thanks, I also uh, want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.